South Asia is no stranger to intense religious and political sentiment as I've learned from quite a lot of folks in our comment section. In earlier editions of Thinking Medieval, we've seen Shaivite saints attacking Buddhists and Jains, acrimonious debates over food and purity, and of course outright violence between Turkic Muslims and Shaivite North Indians, Shaivite South Indians and Sri Lankan Buddhists, and Manipuri Vaishnavites, Animists and Burmese Buddhists. All of them in the videos around here. Now, all of them, of course, bore their own complexities, but one aspect of this turmoil, which is often invisible to us today, is the rich, colourful world of Tantric Buddhism. In the early medieval period, the primary rivals of Shaivites were not Vaishnavites but Tantric Buddhists who had their own set of magical rituals. Lacking anything like social media, Tantric Buddhists turned to the production and circulation of religious texts to try and subsume Shaivites. The Tantric god Trilokya Vijaya, the victor over the three worlds, will allow us to explore how medieval people navigated the religious rivalries that have come to define our world. I'm Anirudh Kanisari, historian author of Lord Zedekin. Welcome to Thinking Medieval, where every week we tell you something new about our complex, innovative past. Always feel free to check out our research and citations below, and remember that we're all figuring out how to think about our messy, bloody, dazzling history. By the 7th to 8th century CE, a bright new age was dawning on monsoon Asia. Stretching from Kashmir to Vietnam, a huge proportion of the world population had come to live in very similar states based on the cultivation of irrigated grain. They had economies centered on networks of temples and long-distance trading emporia, a mobile Sanskrit-speaking intellectual class, and they had political elites interested in rituals to gain and express power and rulership. In southern India, one of the crucial nodes of this world, great changes were afoot. The Pallava dynasty, one of whose princes had become a Tantric Buddhist master and immigrated to China, as we saw in this video here, was beginning to turn decisively towards Shaivism. Now, I've heard the argument that Indian religious traditions didn't see themselves as distinct entities, but I'm really not convinced, especially if you look at the way they saw each other. For example, soon after dynasties began to turn to Shaivism, the Buddhists composed a text called the Assembly of the Essence of All Buddhas, Sarva Tathagata Tattva Sangraha. In chapter 6 of part 2 of the text, they narrated the origins of the deity Trilokya Vijaya or TLV, an abridged version of which goes as follows. The Bodhisattva or future Buddha, Vajrapani, is unable to create a mandala, a magical circle consisting of all the gods, because of what he calls the quote unquote violent and criminal conduct of being such as Shiva. The cosmic Buddha Vairochana intervenes, chanting a mantra that leads to the creation of the wrathful god TLV. Vairochana then chants another mantra which drags Shiva and his entourage into his presence. Shiva refused to acknowledge TLV's authority, saying, quote, Hey, you're just a pathetic nature spirit. I am the creator and destroyer of all beings, the paramount lord of the three worlds. As you can see, Shiva is deliberately cast in a petulant manner. But all his bravado is for nothing, as TLV simply utters a mantra, throws him to the ground, threatens again, embarrasses him before his retinue, and then tramples both Shiva and his consort Parvati. At last, Vairochana intervenes again, granting Shiva nirvana and rebirth as the Buddha Bhashmeshwara Nirghosha. A colourful story, but also a very political one. Shiva, emerging as the dominant god of a world of luxurious royal courts, is presented as an immature, undignified, egoistic being, in stark contrast to the benevolent and merciful Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, who nevertheless possess righteous wrath and powers to back it up. The implication was that Buddhist ritual experts and the kings they initiated were both morally and magically superior to the Shaivites. But this argument was only partially successful. It was mostly in Bihar, the stronghold of monastic Buddhism, where TLV became truly popular in the subcontinent. Elsewhere in South Asia, the monastic and ritual bulwark of Shaivism more than weathered this challenge. More on Shaivite matters here. Now, in parts of Asia where Shaivism was barely present, TLV's worship really took off, especially in China and Tibet. But Java offered an interesting new ground for the god. With both Shaivism and Tantric Buddhism popular on the island, the Buddhists used some rather sneaky techniques to achieve primacy. During the 7th to 8th centuries, Java was slowly developing into a major power. As historian Kenneth R. Hall explains in A History of Early Southeast Asia, groups in rice cultivating villages selected local big brothers or Rakrayan, who sought ritual powers through temple and monastery construction. In the mist-wreathed Dieng Plateau of north-central Java, a Javanese Shaiva center was established, declaring the plateau and its hot water springs to be a mountain of the gods. This center granted powers to emerging royals. 
But in the Kedu plain to the south, a new dynasty, the Shailendras or Lords of the Mountain, inclined towards Tantric Buddhism, granting lands to Tantric masters from across the Indian Ocean, especially Sri Lanka. A Javanese town was even named Lankapura and a monastery was given the title of Abhayagiri, which was the name of a famous Tantric Buddhist order near the Lankan capital of Anuradhapura. It was in this region that we see Asia's most prolific mentions of the god TLV. In one rolled piece of bronze discovered in 1974, he summoned with hair-raising Sanskrit verses, and I quote, Homage to the Lord, who has a body adorned with four arms, who is of terrible appearance, whose right foot hangs down over the heap of twisted locks of Pashupati or Shiva, and whose left foot is placed on Parvati. Destroy the evil thought, the bad thought, the angry thought. Destroy all evil, destroy all enemies, destroy all obstacles, destroy all diseases, destroy all illnesses, destroy all Vinayakas. Fierce one, fierce one. Kill, kill, tear, tear, slay, slay, hail. Just gotta love Tantric Buddhism. <laughs> I also want to point out that this verse mentions the Vinayakas or lords of the obstacles who were worshipped in India as a single benevolent elephant god, Ganesha. More in this video here. This though is the Tantric Buddhist form where the Vinayakas were multiple obstacle creators to be subordinated by the mighty TLV. And even more interesting mention of TLV comes from a gold foil discovered under a temple near the aforementioned Abhagiri monastery. Here the mantras of TLV are inscribed but within a loopy font within which the name of a Shaivite Javanese king is written. It's highly possible that this was meant to harness TLV's powers of summoning, subjugating and buddhavaing Shiva, applying them to a Shaivite king whom the monks were seeking to convert. Alternatively, it might have had the more benign purpose of summoning other gods to help the king, carrying favour with the court. Whether either of these attempts were successful isn't clear, but by the end of the 8th century, the Shailendras of Java were sufficiently Buddhist to order the construction of one of Asia's largest monuments, the immense three-dimensional cosmic mandala of Borobudur. TLV was victorious over Shiva, but only briefly. We will visit Borobudur and see the responses of Asia's Shaivites in future editions of Thinking Medieval. If you have questions or comments, we'd love to hear them. Follow us everywhere on social media. You can find me on Instagram at Anil Buddha and at Connected Histories and on Twitter at Ekanisati. We'll see you next week. <laughs>